that you will hide this humble servant in the shadow of the cross. That Jesus only may be seen and that Jesus only may be heard. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. In doing a little research, I looked to see how much time Americans spent looking at media, social media, uh, other types of media. What I found is most Americans, actually it said every American, which is kind of hard to swallow, but it, that's what, the, that's what the Google said. Every American spends 147 minutes each day on social media and other devices. So I was curious, is there a difference between average Americans and Christian Americans? So I asked Google that. I was taken back that Google was silent. There is no differential in between Christians and regular Americans when it comes to their use of social media. 147 minutes each day. So then you have to ask, what is this media teaching these individuals? What is going into the minds of these individuals as they partake of 147 minutes each day on social media? The events taking place in our world today call for God to intervene. It is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. Psalms 119, 126. Before Jesus comes to put an end to sin, there must first be a great revival in God's people. Preparing God's people for earth's final events and bringing others from the world into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. I want you to turn to your in your Bibles, your devices. It's all right if you're looking at God's word on those devices. To a, a often quoted, often read text in the Old Testament, Second Chronicles seven fourteen, and I want you to turn there because I don't want you to miss all that is contained in this passage. Second Chronicles, chapter seven, verse fourteen. Notice with me, if, that's the very first word, if, taking nothing for granted here, scripture is taking nothing for granted, if my people who are called by my name will, number one, humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Church, are you praying today? Are you seeking God's face? Not collectively in a group, but I'm talking about individually when no one else is looking. No one but you and God. Are you seeking? Are you searching for an audience with your Creator, with your Savior? And then it goes on and turn from their wicked ways. Then comes the next word. It's very interesting. Then, so you notice what we've done, right? We have humbled ourselves because we're called Christians. So we're saying we're God's men and women. 
We have humbled ourselves. We have prayed. And we have seeked the face of God. And we have turned from our wicked ways. Then the passage says, Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Many people think, all i got to do is pray and uh, God will answer my prayer and um, everything's going to be good and I can go about my, my life. Live it the way I want to. It doesn't say that. And I'm sorry, I'm no learned man like uh, my dear brother Johnny. I'm just a simple-minded man. But the passage says, these are the things you do first and then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Do you want your sin forgiven this morning, friends? Do you want your land healed? And that healing of that land, as far as I'm concerned, is the earth made new. God is ready and willing to pour out His Spirit, but revival requires not 50%, not even 85%, but revival requires 100% surrender to God on my part and on your part. Now we're going to get into some touchy areas. where no man dare go. It's not politically correct. So I guess this morning, I will be politically incorrect. Romans chapter 12. Turn with me there. Chapter 12 of Romans. And we see what advice the Apostle Paul has for you and I this morning. Beginning with verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a, what? A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. But he doesn't stop there. For now he's going to get real personal. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I told you that Google didn't give me any information regarding the difference between Christians and regular Americans on social media and the use thereof. So what is going into our minds as Christians? We've already said in the passage there in 2 Chronicles that we are God's people. We're God's men and women. So what is going into my mind? What is shaping and forming my character on a daily basis that says, that testifies to the rest of the world, that man, that woman is ready for Jesus to come? Any habit or practice that would lead into sin and bring dishonor upon Christ would better be put away, whatever the sacrifice. That which dishonors God cannot benefit the soul. The blessings of heaven cannot attend any man in violating the eternal principles of right. And one sin cherished is sufficient to work the degradation of the character and to mislead others. It's bad enough, friends, if you mislead yourselves and allow yourself to be ruined and allow yourself to be lost. But it's a whole different ballgame if you cause one person to stumble in this world. Philippians 4, verse 
Philippians 4, verse 8, and it reads, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Meditate on these things. Think on these things. Here Paul has given to us the recipe of how it is to have a pure, a holy mind. And some may say, my mind's pretty good. I, I don't think real evil thoughts. passage here in Philippians will tell you what you need to be thinking about. And if what you're thinking about, what you're allowing into your mind doesn't fit into the category that's found here in Philippians 4.8, I submit to you that it is not fit for the Christian to think or dwell on or to meditate on. We're going to go a little deeper and a little further. Romans 8, verse 6. We're going to get real politically incorrect. Or I should say, I am. For verse 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You want life? You want peace? Then you need to be spiritually minded. And Philippians told us the things that are, are awesome for you to dwell on, things for you to meditate on. There's a lot of things in this world that we could think about to meditate on, but are they good for us? Will they enhance my relationship with Jesus Christ? Will it tell to myself and my family and those who know me best, my co-workers, the stranger that I meet, that I'm an individual who is preparing for heaven? Verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity. That's a kind of a fancy word. Enmity against God, neither indeed can be. And so I went to my trusty dictionary to find out this word, enmity, and I find that it has two meanings. Neither one are really good. One is to be against. Hmm. And the other word is hostile. So if I'm carnally minded, if I'm not spiritually minded, I am in essence hostile to God. Does that sound like someone who is preparing for heaven? We're going to get a little deeper. James 4. Verse 4. James 4, verse 4. And it reads, Friendship of the world is enmity. There's that word again. And what did we say the meaning was? Hostile or against with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, and here comes the real hard one for many of us Christians to swallow. To be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. I may not be a bad person. I haven't killed anyone. I haven't robbed anyone. 
uh, you know, I, I only do those little white lies because they're innocent, right? I mean, after all, everybody does it. Not everybody who is making themselves ready for heaven. It's not my words, folks. If you have an argument, you argue with the word of God. It's just plain and simple. John tells us in 1 John 3, 2, That the Christian, Christians who are living when Jesus comes will be like Jesus. Did you catch that? Christians who are living when Jesus comes will be like Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. How much are we to be like him? The word like, translated from the Greek, means just like. So, not close to, not vaguely, but it says, just like, just like Jesus. Through his, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, Christ will come and live in each of us. And because of Christ's indwelling presence, the Spirit-filled believer will have the mind of Christ. Do you think that the mind of Christ is thinking and dwelling on the things that we read in Philippians 4, verse 8? Exactly. Because you see, the writers of Scripture were inspired by God to write. Philippians 2, 5 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Believers will have the likes and the dislikes of Christ. Get that now. Believers will have the likes and dislikes of Christ. The love of righteousness and sanctification. And hatred of sin. Jesus is looking for men and women at this time in earth's history, that are not afraid to call sin by its right name. Men and women who will stand for truth though the heavens fall. They will have the same desire to obey the Father that Christ has. Jesus was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And because of Jesus' perfect, righteous obedience to God's law, when we have Jesus living in us, we have His righteous obedience available to us. Permit me this morning a little lead way to read something from one of my favorite authors. It's so powerful. There was nothing I could leave out for it to say exactly what needs to be said and what Frankly, my friends, needs to be heard in every church that calls itself the remnant church. 
every church that claims and testifies that they are waiting for Jesus to come and they're making themselves ready. Those only who have clean hands and pure hearts will stand in the trying time. Now is the time for the law of God to be in our minds, in our foreheads, and written in our hearts. The Lord has shown me the danger of letting our minds be filled with the worldly thoughts and cares. I saw that some minds are led away from present truth and have a love of the Holy Bible by reading other exciting books. Others are filled with perplexity and care for what they shall eat and drink and what they shall wear. We're talking about eternal consequences and we're concerned about what I'm going to put in my belly or what I'm going to put on my back. God have mercy. Some are looking too far off for the coming of the Lord. Time has continued a few years longer than they expected. Therefore, they think it may continue a few years more. And in their way, their minds are being led from present truth and after the world. In these things I saw a great danger for if the mind is filled with other things, present truth is shut out. And there is no place in our forehead for the seal of the living God. Scripture says to the angels, hold back the winds of strife until my servants, till my people are sealed with the seal of the living God. I saw that the time for Jesus to be in the most holy place was nearly finished and that time can last but a very little longer. What leisure time we have should be spent in searching the Bible, which is to judge us in the last day. My dear brothers and sisters, let the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ be in your minds continually and let them crowd out worldly thoughts and care. And when you lie down and when you rise up, let them be your meditation. Live and act holy in reference to the coming of the Son of Man. The sealing time is very short and will soon be over. Now is the time while the four angels are holding the four winds to make our calling and our election sure. This reading was taken from early writings, page 58. Revelation 14, verse 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Dear church, I want to ask you something today. Where's your heart? But more importantly, who has your heart? Does God have your heart fully? Or have you kept some of it back? For your own plans, your own use. What will you refuse to give up in place of eternal life with your Lord and Savior? 
I want you to get your hymnals out because I want us to look at the words of this closing hymn. Many times we sing these hymns and they're beautiful and I love them because they speak volumes to my heart. And I applaud that we still use these old hymns. But this morning I want to make an appeal to every heart. We have folks here that are seasoned church members. We have brand new folks who just love Jesus. And we got some that maybe never have professed anything. Or maybe, maybe even you've given your heart to God years ago. But the cares of this world has interfered with your relationship to Jesus. And if you're honest with yourself, you know you're not ready. If probation closes today for you, will you be ready when Jesus comes? Look at the words with me. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. None of this world's delusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine. There's nothing between. Nothing between like worldly pleasure. Habits of life, though harmless they seem, must not my heart from Him ever serve her. He is my all. There is nothing between. Nothing between many hard trials. Though the whole world against me convenes, watching with prayer and much self-denial, triumph at last, because there's nothing between. Friends, you and I have to get to the point where we're willing to give it all up for Jesus. Get to the point where there's nothing between my soul and my Savior. And as we sing this closing hymn, I invite each of you Right where you stand in your pew to make a recommitment, a rededication. Or if you've never made a commitment before, let today be the day that you make that commitment to Jesus Christ. I'm not appealing to you. Jesus is appealing to you. You're not saying no to me or to this church. You're saying no to Jesus Christ who died for you whose blood was spilt, that you might have eternal life. Let the sun not go down another day before you truly can say there's nothing between. Please stand and make that commitment.
Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we have just sung the song, Nothing Between. And it's the desire of your people who are called by your name to do everything that they can to make sure that there's nothing standing between our soul and our Savior. But Lord, we know that we have an adversary whose sole purpose is to seek and to destroy your people. So it is my prayer this morning, Lord, that you will seal the decisions made here today, the recommitments made here today, that nothing will be between the soul and their Savior, and that Satan will not have power over your people, your children. We thank you for your love, and we pray, Lord, that we will have the mind of Christ. Is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.